Welcome to our In Focus discussion tonight on Magna Earthquake one year later. Just a few days after COVID-19 began infecting the country and shutting down schools, businesses and large gatherings, a 5.7 magnitude earthquake hit the Salt Lake Valley at 7.09 a.m. on March 18th, 2020, adding another dark cloud for the area and rattling those in particular who felt an earthquake for the first time. So what do we learn from that and what information can we take with us moving forward? Joining us now live in studio is Chief Clint Meekum. He is the Division Chief for Unified Fire Authority and Director of Salt Lake County Emergency Management. Also via Zoom, we have Chris Panko, Associate Director for the University of Utah Seismograph Stations. Thank you both for being here tonight and welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, we'll start with you. Now that it's been a year after that 5.7 magnitude earthquake that hit Magna, what do we know about it? So uh, given the size, we weren't sure when it, when it happened, what fault it was on, but we have a really nice seismic network in the Salt Lake Valley. So we were able to detect a number of aftershocks and actually look at the source properties uh, for the earthquake itself. And we learned that um, this earthquake occurred on a, a shallowish fault, so something about 35 degrees, which was different than what we were expecting for a Wasatch Fault, which we had thought was, was a steeper dip. But there had always been these two end member cases for the Wasatch. So one thing we learned from this earthquake was um, that the Wasatch Fault is listrate, which means it steeps really it, the dip is really steep by the mountains and then it gets shallower as it goes under the valley. And so that's really important and that will inform a lot of science going forward as we talk about hazard and risk. I think also importantly, it reminded everyone in this area that, you know, we talk about this being earthquake country and, and hopefully everyone um, believes us now. So we can get earthquakes here, they happen, so. Do you know how widespread it was uh, being felt throughout the state? And do you have any idea how many aftershocks we felt from that quake? Sure, we had over 30,000 felt reports. So people who felt the main shock went in, logged in, logged on to the website and did a did you feel it report. And those reports span largely along the Wasatch Front. So all the way from say Brigham City down by Lehigh, there was um, a focus of uh, felt reports, but it was also felt in Southern Idaho. There were felt reports in Southwestern Wyoming and even some felt reports down by Grand Junction, Colorado. So it was a very widely felt um, earthquake. And now regarding Chris, after, oh, go oh, ahead. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead. Go ahead and finish what you were going to say. Uh, you had also asked about aftershocks. So I was just gonna say, we, we recorded over 2,500 aftershocks. Um, with our uh, local network here. And I think importantly for people is over 130 of those were magnitude two and larger. Normally I don't talk about magnitude two earthquakes because those happen and most people don't notice those, but given the location of the aftershocks right underneath the population center, this seemed to be the magnitude threshold where people were feeling the aftershocks. So especially in those first few weeks, people re were really getting uh, tired of being shaken. Now, Chris, we know that the earthquake was not the big one, which is the one that we've all been anticipating. How would the 5.7 compare to the big one? So we measure energy um, so exponentially. So, you know, we talk about magnitude, say five and a magnitude six in terms of energy, that's a difference of about of a factor of 30, but to go from a magnitude 5.7 to a magnitude seven, which is what we typically talk about when we talk about the big one, that's a an increase in energy of 90. So 90 times the energy, that's the shaking, the duration, the frequency content, everything gets spun up. And at a magnitude 7.5, it's 500 times what we experienced in Magna. So, this was really a moderate earthquake. So like I keep, I keep saying this was a good wake up call for, for all of us. Yeah, that is 
really scary to imagine just um, the multitude between the two earthquakes, the 5.7 and the expected big one. Now, Chief Meekum, let's bring you in. Could you tell us about what you experienced and where you were when last year's 5.7 magnitude earthquake hit the valley? Sure, of course. Um, we had been involved in, uh, in, in the COVID fight for uh, a couple of weeks. Actually, we got involved in COVID uh, on February 28th. And so um, I was headed into the Salt Lake County Emergency Coordination Center that morning, and I was on Bangor in about 4100 South, and uh, my pickup truck did a little bit of a shimmy, like a, like a tailwind had hit me. But um, when I looked around, there was, there was no wind blowing. So I was like, well, that's weird. I wonder what that was. And about five seconds later, my phone lit up, the radio in my truck lit up, and I'm like, oh, that's what it was. So um, <laughs> it was a bit of a, um, you know, focusing on, on, on rolling into the office and what we needed to do that day for COVID. Uh, it was a complete uh, uh, mind shift uh, and, and pivot um, to, to start dealing with this, this new situation. And um, I, I can tell you that the, the pivot happened very, very rapidly. There were approximately 300 people in the Salt Lake County Emergency Coordination Center already dealing with COVID. And all of those folks were able to make a very rapid, uh, very smooth pivot um, into this, this new incident uh, to make sure that we were in a position to support um, our, our municipalities and our tactical commanders in the field with whatever it is they might need. We appreciate our emergency management crews so much. Okay, Chief Meekum and Chris hold that thought. We have to take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. Thanks for staying with us for our second in focus discussion tonight on Magna Earthquake one year later. Before the break, we were joined by Chief Clint Meekum and Chris Panko. We pick up now right where we left off. We'll start with you, Chief Meekum. Tell us about the emergency response from there. How quickly did our management teams assemble and what was the process at that point forward? So the first step in the process is it starts with our first responders in the fire stations, uh, in their police precincts, uh, the dispatch centers in the valley, assessing to make sure that uh, um, their structures and their facilities and their equipment are in a, in a position where they can continue to respond. And that happened very, very rapidly. Um, within the Salt Lake County Emergency Coordination Center, again, uh, we were able to make a very, very rapid and um, relatively smooth pivot from the COVID operations that we had been conducting um, into into this, um, this earthquake mode. Uh, and again, we were, uh, some of our first things that we, we needed to consider doing were getting out um, uh, an integrated public alert warning system or IPAWS alert to, to our citizens to let them know what had happened and to give them any just real quick instructions on what to do. Um, starting to um, um, get damage assessments from our first responders uh, out in the field so we could start uh, seeing where the, the focus of the damage was. And, and to assess really the extent that, um, that our resources were being tapped. So again, that all happened very, very rapidly. Uh, we've, we've done a number of training and exercises over the years with our, with our fantastic municipal partners and our state partners, as well as our federal partners. And again, all of that gelled very, very quickly. Um, and um, the, everybody would be very, very proud of the way our, our first responder community, our emergency management community um, um, came together and, and got out to take care of business. Time was really of the essence here. On that note, Chief, where do we see the brunt of the damage caused by this earthquake? And do we know how much estimated damage the earthquake caused in total? Sure, so um, the, elimin the, the preliminary damage assessments that we started to get very early on, um, uh, obviously we're kind of focused around uh, Magna Main Street and the residential areas in Magna um, being uh, older, uh, older structures out in that area, uh, that was not completely unexpected once we learned um, kind of where the epicenter was suspected to be and what the magnitude was. Uh, as the day went on, we started to get um, additional reports from Salt Lake City, uh, from West Valley, uh, a, a little bit into Mill Creek, uh, and again, those, those unreinforced masonry structures seemed to be um, the main cause of the damage that we sustained, but it was primarily focused in, in Magna, uh, Salt Lake City and West Valley. Uh, with, our, with our damage assessments and, and, our, and our partnerships with FEMA, um, one of the tools that FEMA uses to estimate damage puts, puts our loss, physical loss, at approximately $62 million, 
with an economic loss being estimated at about $600 million. That, that'll fluctuate as we continue to, to get into the damage as, as FEMA continues to assist with paying out claims, as insurance claims come in, et cetera, et cetera. But right now, those are the numbers that we have. It just shows how long term the damages really last and the time it takes to really recover from this. Uh, Chris, we're going to turn to you. Based on geologic evidence, we know that there's been approximately 20 earthquakes in the last 10,000 years that have been magnitude 7.0 or higher along the Wasatch Front. So we know it's going to happen again in the future. Earlier in the show, you called the Magna earthquake a wake up call. Can you elaborate a little bit more on this? And what do we learn from this? So we, like I mentioned, this is earthquake country. So we know that we have extension. So we're building stress across this fault. So that's why we've had these large events in the past. And that's why we know we'll have them in the going forward is we can actually measure th this deformation. So um, in terms of what we learned, I, I think it's, I hope it means that we've learned to be more prepared and um, and we just use those past earthquakes to continue to help guide us going further. We've also learned more about where the fault is and that will help in our modeling efforts. Chris, can we forecast or detect when a big earthquake might be coming? And if so, why? And if not, why not? I wish. Um, so there's a lot about earthquakes we know and there's still a lot that we don't know. So. One of the main things we don't know is what the actual state of stress is on the fault and at each sort of part along the fault, what that stress state is. And so since we can't know that, we can't give you a time and a day to plan for. What we do instead is we talk about probabilities. So we know in the next 50 years, there's a about a one in two chance of a magnitude 6.75 or larger event occurring along the Wasatch Front. So. Um, that's about as close as we can nail down a time. And that's why it's so important for us to get ready now. Don't wait until it happens to be um, responding to this situation. Uh, Chief, we have about 30 seconds left. Our next guest will talk more about emergency preparedness, but I'd like to give the final word to you. Anything else that you'd like our viewers to know tonight? Just back to basics. Uh, everybody, and Chris has been talking about um, um, preparedness. I'd like to just emphasize that basic family preparedness, 96 hour kits, uh, family emergency communications plans, practice those, use those. Uh, remember to include your pets, remember to include your medications in those kits. Uh, and and when, when an emergency does happen, stop, take a breath, remember what, what you've heard and what you've learned and apply it. If we can make it through 2020, we can prepare for the future. <laughs> All right. You've been hearing from Chief Clint Meekum, the Division Chief for Unified Fire Authority and Director of Salt Lake County Emergency Management, and Chris Panko, Associate Director for the University of Utah Seismograph Stations. Thank you both for spending your Friday night with us. We appreciate your expertise so much. Thanks, Rosie. Welcome to our third and final in focus discussion tonight on Magna earthquake one year later. Earlier we talked about the impact of the 5.7 magnitude earthquake that rattled most of the Salt Lake Valley as well as the lessons learned. Now we turn to emergency preparation and what you can do to help keep your family and home protected and safe. Joining us now live in studio is Wade Matthews, the Be Ready Utah manager for the Utah Division of Emergency Management. Wade, thanks for being here tonight and welcome to the show. Uh, my pleasure, thanks for having me. Wade, what are some things that Utahns and their families can do to best prepare for emergency situations like a big earthquake? Well, basically having a family disaster plan in place, which can consist of several different elements, communications, having an out of state telephone contact that everybody can check in with and that person will relay messages because we don't know if we're gonna be together when an earthquake happens you know, at home or work or school or the store. Also have a meeting place outside of your home and a meeting place outside of your neighborhood in case maybe the phones aren't working. We know that we can go look for our loved ones there and this gives us peace of mind knowing that we can be reunited again. Also doing a home hazard hunt. Check your water heater, make sure it's fastened to the wall. Uh, fasten tall furniture to the wall with L brackets or the little nylon straps and make sure they're not tipping over in the shaking. Move heavy objects from high shelves to low shelves and especially 
the, anything that may be over children's beds, move those things away from there. And then have a flashlight and a good pair of shoes by your bed in case the earthquake happens at night, the power may be out, you can grab that flashlight, put on your good pair of shoes, protect your feet from broken glass and debris and those types of things. These are tips that you are going to regret not doing if the time comes and you're not prepared. So Wade, what are some items that Utahns should have in their emergency kit? Our disaster supply kit should basically contain everything that we might need to get us through short, a short term period in the recovery process of the powers out if we can't go to the store for food or the water, uh, uh, water may be cut off, those types of things. So we're talking uh, a minimum of three days supply, but they're saying maybe five days is a better idea of food and water, medications, first aid kit, some tools including a battery operated AM FM radio, which is kind of old fashioned these days, um, flashlight, wrenches, some tools, uh, uh, and, and personalize your kit. If there's anything that you need to be happy, healthy, and comfortable every day, put a little bit of that in your kit and personalize your kit. No matter what list you might be using or what, if you bought a uh, pre-built kit at the store, personalize your kits. Now most people are familiar with the drop, cover, and hold action when they're experiencing an earthquake. What should someone do in different locations when a big earthquake hits, such as if they're in bed, outside, or driving in a car? Yeah, when the Magna earthquake hit at 709, I'm sure there were many people in bed. You stay in bed and just pull your pillow over your head and provide some cover for your face in case glass or things might be flying through the air. Uh, if you're driving, try to pull over as soon as you safely can and try not to stop uh, on a bridge or under an overpass or underneath power lines or, or tall trees or buildings. And if you're driving, as Clint explained earlier, he didn't know it was an earthquake and just a little bit of shaking. But uh, if you do realize that's what's happening, that's the best thing to do. And that drop, cover, and hold on. If you get underneath a desk table, a chair, hold on till the shaking stops. That provides some a cover overhead that protects us from falling objects, which are the biggest cause of injury and death in an earthquake. If you don't have a desk or table, a chair to get underneath of, um, just kneel down on the floor up against an interior wall and cover your head and neck uh, uh, with your arms and hands like you saw there in the video. Try not to be against a wall that has any glass overhead like uh, mirrors, picture frames, windows. Let's talk, let's talk about the Great Utah Shakeout, which is scheduled for April 15th this year. For those who don't know, can you tell us about the event and how they can participate? The Great Utah Shakeout, yes, April 15th, is an emergency, uh, an earthquake drill to practice the drop, cover, and hold on protective action so that everybody knows what that means and how to do it, and it becomes, becomes second nature to us if we do find ourselves in another earthquake, earthquake situation like we did. Um, and it's simply that, just get underneath, the, uh, you know, drop, cover, and hold on wherever you're at. Imagine the shaking might be happening, and then after a minute you can stop. It's a good thing to add to that drop, cover, and hold on drill, an evacuation drill. Go out to your meeting place outside of your home or maybe outside of your, uh, your, your office and take accountability, make sure everybody's okay. You can register for the shakeout at shakeout.org slash Utah. Now, Wade, we've got about 30 seconds left. Any final words, anything you want to include in our conversation tonight that we haven't addressed yet? Yeah, take, take your emergency preparedness efforts just a little bit at a time. It can seem overwhelming, but it, it's important to do because we don't rise to the occasion in a disaster. We sink to our level of preparedness, and how low do we want to sink? So I just encourage people to take a little bit of action towards preparedness as, uh, when they can. Make it doable to them. Uh, you know, make it fit within their budget, within their circumstances, and, and everybody can have that uh, preparedness in place. Well said. You've been hearing from Wade Matthews, the Be Ready Utah Manager for the Utah Division of Emergency Management. Wade, thanks for being here with us tonight and joining us for this discussion. My pleasure.